In the 12th century, in the rugged cedars mountain of Lebanon, a hermit seeking to get closer to God decides to make a retreat for himself at the bottom of a remote and rocky cliff. With little assistance from the tools of the time, his bare hands create the semblance of a dwelling, a retreat for solitude, prayer, and contemplation. Thus begins the journey of the convent of Marserkis. Overlooking the town of Pshari and the Kadisha Canyon, the convent enjoys a peaceful distance and a wonderful view. In the 15th century, the small retreat becomes the headquarters of the papal nuncio, and a century later, the local branch of the French consulate. In the year 1701, the town of Pshari donates the small Marsarkis retreat to the religious order of the Carmelites, who labor to expand it into a convent. They dig caves and passages and build floors and staircases. They bring busy life to the convent up to the early 20th century when they establish themselves in the town center, leaving the convent for good. Here in Pshari, this once mystical place, Shubran is born in 1883. Here he is baptized in the temple of nature. Here he begins to sense his belonging to the earth and the sky. Throughout Gibran's life, this deserted convent was to him the symbol of solitude and mysticism. In his will, he later asks to be buried in the rocks of its small chapel. Upon his death in New York in 1931, his body is brought across the seas to Pshari, his beloved home, where he peacefully lay in the convent's chapel. Gibran's sister Mariana acquires the Masarkis convent and donates it to Pshari. In 1975, the National Committee of Gibran modifies the convent into a museum. From Gibran's workshop in New York came the whole museum patrimony. Such was Gibran's request to Mary Haskell in his will. All his works be donated to the town of Pshari. His dearest belongings, his furniture, his rare antiquities, his beloved drawings, and the ones he himself admired most, those of Mary Haskell, the woman who was his sole mate throughout his life and who witnessed his successive births. In addition, the museum holds about 450 pictures, oil paintings, watercolors, pencil sketches, as well as manuscripts, books, and letters. For that, Gibran's presence in his museum is all the more vivid, all the more felt. I ache for solitude, the only place in the world where I am alone after a fashion is in my studio. In a house, I prefer not to have a great deal, but I need a few little things around of beauty. They are like colors in my palette. Entering Gibran's world is in itself an adventure, both spiritually and soul-searching. It is coming upon a whole new perspective on the universe.
art. You are the spirit of God, fluttering between the hearts of men and infinity. With your invisible fingers, you turn the elements into images, shadows, sculptures, and melodies that remain beautiful till the end. Art, make me one of your priests and touch my soul that it may come close to its maker. shall you seek beauty and how shall you find her unless she herself be your way or your guide beauty is life when life unveils her holy face but you are life and you are the veil beauty is eternity gazing at itself in a mirror but you are eternity and you are the mirror Gibran's private book collection speaks for his passion for universal knowledge. A closer look at these books, at the pages bearing spontaneous comments in his own handwriting, reveals the broadness of his culture and the diversity of his artistic and intellectual affiliations. His library in the museum reflects an almost physical presence of Gibran himself as if each book was still held in the warmth of the hand that leafed it. His manuscripts in Arabic or English, the two languages in which he wrote, his letters, essays, notes, sketches and scribblings all provide an insight into Gibran's heart and remain through time the living witnesses of the torments of mankind. In his beginnings, Gibran preferred the artist in him to the writer. But the wide diffusion of his book, The Prophet, sanctioned the writer's fame well before that of the artist. The Prophet was my attempt to reproduce the Jesus face. Oh Mary, how I have worked on the Prophet. I discovered this color for flesh. In the earlier pictures, the flesh was much less clear and simple and sure in color. And see the color in these? I've been working at color schemes all summer. About a dozen of them I'd like to put in the profit.
Amidst Gibran's visions hanging in the museum, questions emerge, profound, bewildering, and as old as the history of man. People say much complicated things about my drawings. For when I draw, if it happens that I do something a little nice or with some worth, I'm unconscious. Three or four hours after it's done, I can't tell you anything about what it looks like. I'm not that way when I write. I do know what I'm writing, but I don't know what I'm drawing or painting. Actually, when I read all these things that are sometimes said, I feel almost as if I were cheating, for I worked as simply as a child. is making someone uncomfortable in body or in spirit is a source of pain and unhappiness to me. We cannot teach the chastity of the nude. People must find it for themselves. We cannot lead people to the hearts of life. They must go by themselves and each one must go alone. The stony staircase plunge narrow and sinuous leads to the small chapel where Gibran's body rests. By his side hangs his portrait, drawn in oil by Yusuf Hwayek, his friend from the Paris era. I am alive like you, and I now stand beside you. Close your eyes and look around you will see me in front of you. These words are burnt into wood as an epitaph on his tomb. Here is his tomb, his last home where he chose to rest in peace for eternity. The humble bed the easel, the colors, the personal belongings, the large Byzantine mural that he so dearly loved. They all kept him company in his New York retreat. And now, as he lies in his tomb in the rocky convent, they still do.
you would know the secret of death. But how shall you find it unless you seek it in the heart of life? If you would indeed behold the spirit of death, open your heart wide unto the body of life. For life and death are one, even as the river and the sea are one. Brief were my days among you, and briefer still the words I have spoken. Fare you well. This day has ended. <laughs>